Welcome to the continuation of our class on post free which is some um, history of African political thought. Um, we'll continue with the political thoughts of um, Kwame Nkrumah, the Ghanaian political hero and one of Africa's finest political philosopher. He was described as a historical beacon in the field of Africa's political thought. At the end of this session, it is expected that the students should be able to discuss the life and contributions of Nkrumah to African political thought. Kwame Nkrumah lived between 21st September 1909 and April 27, 1972. He was born in Gold Coast and was the leader of Ghana from 1952 to 1966. And uh, he was the first president of Ghana and its first prime minister. One of the 20th century advocates of Pan-Africanism and the winner of Lenin Peace Prize in 1963. In 1935, he proceeded to the United States where he obtained bachelor's degree from Lincoln University, Pennsylvania in 1949, master's degree in education from University of Pennsylvania as well, and um, was awarded an honorary doctorate by Lincoln University. In 1947, Nkrumah was invited back home to serve as the general secretary of the United Gold Coast Convention, UGCC, under Joseph Dankwa. Uh, he has numerous publications, some of which include Ghana, the autobiography of Kwame Nkrumah, which was published in 1957, Africa Must Unite, 1963, African Personality, 1963, African Socialism Revisited, 1967, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Capitalism, published in 1965, Anxioms of Kwame Nkrumah, 1967, Voice from Conakry, 1967 also, uh, Dark Days in Ghana, 1968, Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, 1968, Philosophy and Ideology for Decolonization, 1970, Class Struggle in Africa, 1970, The Struggle Continue, 1973, I Speak of Freedom, 1973, Revolutionary Path, 1973, among many others, an indication that um, he was an accomplished scholar, he was an accomplished author, he combined politics with academics. Now, by the beginning of 1963, as we are all aware, African states were still divided into two competing power blocks, the Casablanca Group and the Monrovia Group. The two groups continue to dominate African politics amidst disagreements and strife. Though the groups wanted unity, the way and manner to achieve this unity posed a big problem. The Summit of Heads of State, which opened on the 23rd of May, concluded its proceedings on 25th May with the formal signing of the Charter of the Organization of African Unity, or AU. In the conference, Nkrumah proposed for a strong union of Africa, a common foreign policy and diplomacy. At the close of the conference, a charter that institutionalized the OAU was adopted and ratified by the 31 participating governments uh, in that conference. It could be said that Addis Ababa Conference of 1963 provided an auspicious ground to reconcile the differences in their orientation, at least temporarily. The conference was preceded by the preparatory conference of foreign ministers of independent African states though the conference could not arrive at an agreement as to the proper definition of African unity. It provided agenda that made it possible for the meeting of heads of states and governments 
of Africa because most of the countries who participated in that conference had just attained independence. So for them to submit their sovereignty in the name of African unity, in the name of a single political entity, became a problem. The prominent inclination in the conference was towards the preservation of national sovereignties and a national interests, which were the only basis that the Monrovia group moderated, could compromise the charter, uh, which ended temporarily the search for African unity, though there was no unified perspective for achieving continental unity. The fact that the core of Pan-Africanism was rejected at Addis Ababa, it was the uncommitted Pan-Africanists for whom unity had a secondary value that could be bargained away and alliance among the governing class for the maintenance of post-colonial status quo that emerged triumphant. The unity crop of Pan-Africanists rejected the proposal for African political unification and this shattered the aspiration of a greater Africa. This rejection of the concept of Pan-Africanism through the unity of African people in such a manner held by the core Pan-Africanists meant a rejection of um, African unification. Nkrumah criticized the imperialist intention of perpetual domination of Africa and therefore outlined basic strategies for African liberation. Nkrumah believed that like the Marxists that the forces of capitalism and exploitation has imbued contradictions that will destroy its working principles. According to him, imperialism has certain inevitable results which will eventually overtake it. And he enumerated them as one, the emergence of a colonial intelligentsia. Two, the awakening of national consciousness among colonial people. Three, the emergence of working class movement. And four, the growth of a national liberation movement. Nkrumah's theory of African liberation is underpinned by the following arguments. One, that the monopoly and control of capital by the imperialists against their dependent colonies inspires and accelerates the revolt of the colonial intelligentsia. Two, as capital is exported to the colonies, exploitation intensifies and capitalism grows into the world system. Three, the economic domination of the colonies by the capitalists leads to an equal development of capitalist countries bringing about contradictions between rich and poor countries. The struggle is resolved in war, which creates alliance between the struggling forces, therefore weakening imperialism, thus bringing the workers of the capitalist countries and the colonial suffering masses together to achieve liberation. Nkrumah concludes that this scenario will lead to a intensification of crisis within the colonies, b the growth of liberation movements, and c that since it cannot be averted under imperialism, a coalition between the proletariat in the capitalist countries and the colonial liberation movements becomes inevitable. Therefore, he underlined the practical strategies for effective freedom of the colonial peoples in terms of the organization of the colonial masses through the mobilization of labor and the youths, mass political education through the national liberation movements. According to Nkrumah, the goals of the national liberation movement could be realized through a. The establishment of a people's press to stir up through political consciousness, which could lead to uh, 
unrest here and there to disturb the colonial masters, B, a broad social, economic, and political plan embracing the conditions for desired political freedom. For Nkrumah, the goals of national liberation specifically include political freedom and complete independence from colonialism. Democratic freedom and freedom from political tyranny and exploitation. Social reconstruction and freedom from poverty and economic exploitation. All these will lead to complete unconditional independence and the building of a society of people in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Now, we'll look at Nkrumah's role in the Casablanca group because the Casablanca group were the radical groups. They were the groups of Pan-Africanists who were uncompromising, who believe strongly in African political unity. There is no doubt that it was the formation of the Brazzaville group that evoked immediate reaction from the more militant members of the African continent made up of Ghana, Guinea, and Mali at the time. They stood as members of Union of African States and issued a declaration on December 24, 1960, stating that the three heads of state deplored the attitude taken by certain African heads of state, that is, the Brazzaville group, whose stand was likely to jeopardize the unity of Africa and strengthen neocolonialism. They condemned all forms of African initiative based on languages of colonial powers. They therefore appealed to these heads of state to follow a higher and healthier conception of African unity. From the 4th to 7th January 1961, a meeting was held in Casablanca to discuss the Congo situation and in attendance were Ghana, Guinea, Libya, Egypt, Mali, Morocco and Algeria. These nations constituted the radical Casablanca group or block of the time and um, the conference passed a number of a resolution. One, on African unity. It recommended the creation of an African consultative assembly. It also called for the creation of four committees, notably the African Political Committee, to coordinate and unify the general policy of the various African states. The African Economic Committee to periodically take decision on African economic cooperation the African Cultural Cooperation and Assistance, and Joint Africa High Command to safeguard the independence of African states. Those who belong to the Monrovia group, the African heads of state who belong to the Monrovia group were never, never comfortable uh, w with these statements. Due to their strong views on the Congo and other African issues, the Casablanca group was christened a radical group. They were against all forms of imperialism and neocolonialism and pinned their hope on socialism as the only way to economic and social emancipation of Africa. The views of Casablanca group infused fear in the minds of other non-militant African heads of states who felt their positions were threatened by this radical posture. This fear was reflected in the ensuring charter of the OAU as the non-interference clause, the respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of each state and for its inalienable right to independent existence all found their way into the OAU charter, thereby daunting the Pan-African spirit. Thank you. We shall consolidate on that in our next lecture. <laughs>